Football's right around the corner. Get in on the action with DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. And with the NFL returning, DraftKings is giving new customers $200 in free bets instantly when you bet $1 or more on any football game. Listen up, because you don't want to miss this. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use promo code ART19 to receive $200 in free bets when you place a $1 bet on any football game and get a free shot at a million top prize with your first deposit. That's promo code ART19 for a limited time only at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. Must be 21 or older, New Jersey, Indiana, or Pennsylvania only. New customers only, minimum $5 deposit and $1 wager required. One per customer. Restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com slash sportsbook for details. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or in Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. Fill her up. You're listening to the Gas Digital Network. People can change anything they want to. And that means everything in the world. Show me any country and there'll be people in it. It's time to take the humanity back into the center of the ring and follow that for a time. You know, think on that. Without people, you're nothing. Without people, you're nothing. Stoke the fire. Oh, look at that little mug right there. Halloween's come early, ladies and gentlemen. It's Stoke the fire (laughs) time. Matt Stocks, Jesse Leach. Um, a Jack Skeleton mug being Certainly. spotted there. Um, this is episode 26 of the show. We just had Adam D from Kill Switch Engage as our guest last week. And we're going to kind of continue with the autobiographical thread as we roll into this episode. Um, I actually heard this lady on the Rob Flynn podcast, and I was blown away by her story and the layers and the levels to it. Um, we're going to try and cover as much ground as we can. I feel like this is an episode that we could revisit or a guest that we could revisit. Sorry, down the line. I can already tell we won't get through anywhere near all of it. Um, but Jesse, before we bring her on, why don't you explain a little bit about who this woman is, your connection to her, um, and then we will bring her around the campfire and onto the show. Yes, um, I'll try to keep it brief, but it's going to be tough. So I met this woman when I was about 22, 23 years old. It's It's kind of hard to remember exactly I was having trouble with my voice and she came highly recommended and the moment I met her there was a connection not just as a teacher student but as a friend and as someone who just is an old soul which people will see if anyone who knows her knows this um, and not only that but she's been a dear friend and she was by my side through my vocal surgery every step of the way like a, a mother figure someone I admire very much and I would say I wouldn't have a career without her and she's a dear friend and an honored to have on the show the master the zen master melissa cross melissa come on in oh dear <laughs> now you bet you've pumped me up I'm, I'm nervous now oh that's that's i didn't even get started to pump you up get out of here <laughs> i love i love your flat or house melissa it's a very lovely background oh thank you you know how you do that you put all the mess behind the the yeah. object, you know. <laughs> I know what your place looks like too. <laughs> yeah, my mess is over here. <laughs> yeah, what a pleasure to have you on the show. And I did hear I literally last night just listened to your appearance on Rob's show and, and was blown away by that. Um because Rob doesn't always go deep and it was actually really nice hearing him get deep as well and share some some pretty heavy and, and crazy stuff in regards to to his life and experience. With this yeah. one, usually if Jesse and the guest have a connection, I like to try and begin with their story, but I feel like there's a thousand stories before Jesse comes into your life. Um, <laughs> would you agree, Jesse? Should we take it right back to the start? And Yes, I agree. Upbring- I, upbringing? I, for people who don't know who she is, I think it's important to, to note where you got your start with the voice, like why the voice became so important to you. What was the catalyst for you becoming who you are and essentially having your entire career based around, you know, the Zen of screaming and voice singing and speaking and all that stuff that I've learned from you. Where did that all start? Uh Oh, okay. So (laughs) there are no short answers as well. So don't worry. (laughs) You have to understand that I am twice as old as you. So there's a lot of stuff to get through. So, um, I was a performer when I was four years old. So I was born in Texas, uh, to a Scottish psychiatrist and a Southern Texas sort of socialite. 
and uh, wow. they met. Uh, well, my dad was teaching at medical school and my mother was in nursing school. And so they eloped and then he joined the Air Force to get his American citizenship. And if my English, if my accent starts to like sound like yours, Matt, I can't help it. I always have to because I lived in the UK for a long time. I went to the old Vic Theater School. Um, and so they tried to rub out all my American accent, you know, by the end of school. So whenever I hear an accent, I pick it up. And so I'm not making fun of you if it happens. <laughs> it's all good. I, I was really enjoying listening to you explain the, you know, the history of the old Vic and trying to like, you know, explain <laughs> to an American what a kind of prestigious school that is um and to get in there i mean they let what like a handful of people out of several thousand applicants each year so to yeah get that's it... right like 25 people out of about five thousand. and i i had to be british i mean they wouldn't take me as an american so i basically lived with a lady of the theater mm -hmm. you know from the west end and she kind of coached me and i had all kinds of private coaching I was, you know, this goes way back. Like I have been, I wanted to be the best since I was five years old. It was all about like, look at me, look at me. And I saw my dad who was a frustrated actor. Like his parents made him go to medical school, but actually he wanted to be an actor. So I kind of watched him and I started putting on plays when I was five years old. And then I got into ballet. And when I was six, I swore I was going to be the best ballerina in the world. But by the time I was 12, I was told that my neck and my arms and my legs were way too short. The Bolshoi came to town and I was supposed to be, you know, the number one pick because I could jump the highest and I could turn, you know, fuetes and all that stuff. But they wouldn't even let me audition because I was too squatty. So um, I uh, said, OK, then I'll be the best actress in the world. And I. Uh, thing is, I, I, I joined a repertory company, like a professional repertory company as an intern, and I cleaned toilets and handed out programs, but I got into the plays, and uh, it's pretty funny because I was doing my audition with Lady Macbeth, so I got this record of Dame Sybil Thorndike doing the speech from Macbeth, and I copied it exactly. So you can imagine this 12-year-old girl going, out, damn, spot, out. I, I just complete. everyone was just like, oh. So um, I was a faker. I was an imposter. We all know about that. Well, that's, but, what, uh, acting, that's what acting is, right? <laughs> uh -huh, I'm really good at it. <laughs> I'm a very good imposter. So all that training, and the old Vic theater school is pretty much at the basis of the technical stuff that I began. I went to Interlochen, and that's a high school for the arts in Michigan. I ran away from home so many times to make my parents send me there because I was very, um, I was what's called a spooky chick. You know, I wore all black, I had a black armband for the Vietnam War, and I wrote poetry and I was a loner and I was a spooky chick. And I was the girl that always said, I love you too fast. And why, why don't you love me back? And very open and honest, but just a complete failure with like boys. So I started playing guitar uh, when I was 14 and I started um, writing songs, especially to boys, because I, I wanted them to fall in love with me because I was too squatty to get it. The, 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 the real way. <laughs> so if I could do the, the songs and you know, that kind of worked <laughs> a little bit. Well, why, um, does anybody, anyway. why does anybody start a band when they're young, right? Is to get exactly the guy exactly. or the girl. Can we talk? Yes, of course. So while I was in acting school, I was playing guitar and doing that. So by the time I finished the old Vic theater school, I was fed up with it. I just, it was fake. And I said, you know what? I want to do this rock and roll thing. Cause it's my show. Like I get to do my show, right? So it's the same thing really. Um, and, uh, but I still have this penchant for Shakespeare and stuff. Like I really still want to do that. That's kind of like my, uh, if I can still remember lines after I uh, get ahead with this Zen of screaming thing, which has been going on for about 25 years, um, then I'd like to go back to it because I really, I really like acting. But anyway, to answer Jesse's question, I was technically um, 
trained from a very early age in ballet, in voice, in piano, and guitar. Like I was just consumed with it. And at Interlochen, I met a guy named Morgan Walker. Morgan Walker was one of the guys, or actually the guy that drove Killswitch and Gage around before they were signed, setting up their sound. He also was having problems recording them. So he said, Melissa, you're, you're a voice person. Can you help me get these kids through a recording session? And I said, sure, why not? And I think the first person was um, the guy from Dismay, who's just recently passed, um, passed a few years ago. Uh, and then the second person was Jesse. Uh, the, actually, the second person was supposed to be Jamie Josta. So Morgan signed the publishing of all these bands, and his idea was to build this sort of hippie freak utopia of metal musicians, like they'd have insurance and you know mortgages, and like he was going to take all this publishing money and then make this kind of empire. But it really backfired because obviously Roadrunner and a bunch of other people wanted that publishing. And so they kind of ripped him, ripped him up pretty badly. And um, anyway, that's how, it, that's how the Zen of Screaming started. It's Morgan took me to a Megadeth Slayer Bad Brains show in somewhere, like I think it was the late eighties. And uh, I looked down at the, at, the, at the, well, it wasn't called a pit then, I was in the balcony and I looked down on this sea of people that were moshing and they all had these clothes and they were doing these signals. And I was like, this is the most amazing thing. This is where it's at. And I said, fuck, I'm too old. Like all these are kids. How could I be a part of this without being a major poser? And then two weeks later, Morgan called me and then I accepted the challenge of trying to figure out how to make that sound in a sustainable, healthful way. So I, I, I took the challenge. I made the sound in a quiet way, in a sustainable way, went to the doctor, put the camera in, and we started talking about how this works. And, and from then on, people lined up like it was, you know, then came Brian from Shadows Fall, and then came Randy from Lamb of God, and Toby from H2O, and Andrew WK, and they just kept lining up. And within two years, I could not teach that many people. So I made this little film called The Zen of Screaming, which I didn't do to be cool. I just wanted the information out there so that everybody could get it. And it became very successful without me, you know, doing too much. So that was 2005, and here we are. Yeah. <laughs> so now I have loads. Like the guy that used to be the editor of Revolver said, my client list is longer than the potty, what do you call those things? port sand like line at OzFest, you know, because <laughs> I have so many, like hundreds, and they're all like my people. I mean, I, they're my people. And so this collective consciousness of metal is it's it's what i i i stand for mm. um and i i i feel very at home like rob calls me metal yoda <laughs> pretty much true who you are <laughs> metal yoda <laughs> or you know metal den mother you know i i felt like welcomed and i've felt very useful in this i feel like i have like a calling and a usefulness is kind of the source of happiness for me after you know being self-serving and addicted for actually i've been sober longer than i was addicted recently <laughs> oh, wow. so that's a that's an interesting thing right that's amazing so, um uh yeah it's a it's a, it's it's all about do what you love, do what's in your heart, and uh, don't worry about success. I thought that I wanted, I thought I was going to die if I wasn't a rock star. From until I was like forty, maybe, I thought, geez, you know, I don't want to live if I can't be rocker, and uh, it just all worked out in the best possible way. Because I can do this till I'm fucking ninety. <laughs> 
and your impact has been massive because of what you did. So you might not be the quote unquote rock star that you are, but you are in your own right a rock star because you've helped countless people do what they do and continue on, including myself, like I said in the intro of this, were it not for your instruction and your not just your instruction though, but your your care and consideration and friendship, because you go above and beyond. You did that with me when I first met you and it, you did it with me after my surgery. Without that, there wouldn't be a lot of these guys out there doing, there would be shows canceled, there'd be careers, you know, you changed the entire game and now people just mimic what you've started because there are people out there mimicking what you've done, but you can't be understated what you've done. And I can say that just from personal experience. So it's amazing that you were able to find this technique and how did that even come about? That's something I've always wanted to ask you. How did you even like stumble upon the vocal fry and like how did that even happen? It's like, it blows my mind. Sometimes I, it blows my mind that I know the answers to questions that I didn't like, where did I get that? I, I think, um, well, I had an injury. Like I was singing at CBGB's in the eighties and I let out one rip curdling, you know, scream. It's nothing like the screaming that, you know, that we do now. But, you know, because in the 80s, it was more like, you know, hardcore, like it was still punk rock new wave back then. So, you know, and I just gotten, you know, I came back from the UK, like I was in the middle of Kings Road and that the Stranglers and 999 and like the Sex Pistols, I was there. So when I came to the United States, I was already on some kind of journey with the sort of more advanced uh manifestations of rock so it was just a continuation but i got injured and when i got injured at that time six months of vocal rest was the wisdom so i did vocal rest for six months and i hit the books and i started vocal science and that was 1985. so by the time you know i met you i was already pretty technically adept at not only voice technique but also why scientifically these things were happening and i would show up i still do show up at all these you know voice science symposiums like doing research like you know i'm i am still part of vocal research with people with lots of letters by their name that come to me and say well what do you think of this and what do you think this is and you know we do tests with cameras and spectrograms and so it's been a long and fascinating journey in vocal science. I, um, so how did I start that? Well, I figured out how to make the sound without the implication of the emotion, because I realized that that's where the problem was, was that the authenticity of the emotion of screaming, i.e. road rage, trash your room, that was the problem with the sustainability, is that that lack of control would override like the basic, you know, balance of the vocal process. So I made the sound quietly. And that's what I looked at is the quietness of it. And then I realized that the quietness doesn't have to be that much louder because the frequencies in the fry are so high and they hit the human ear louder than other frequencies. So something is like, I'm going to go, ah, right? That was super quiet. But when that hits a microphone, the microphone does something to those frequencies, particularly the higher ones. And it sounds louder, no matter what. If you have that kind of like, that high pitched squeal, it doesn't compete with anything except a China symbol on the stage. You know, like it's louder than the bass, the kicks, everything because of the human hearing. So basically I, I study this stuff and I, I'm fascinated with it. And, uh, but I also like to be useful. Like, you know, it's not just about me. So I remember, I think it was Coney Island or something. I saw a show, uh, it was a kill switch show. I think, did you, I think Volbeat was there as well. Do you remember that show? Yes. Um, uh, I remember the, the date. I don't remember details, but I do remember Okay, so I saw you on the stage and I was like, oh my fucking God, he's killing himself. And it was right, it was right after, it was right after you, you know, you know, you took back over, right? 
and I was like, and I saw you kind of doing a little bit of like some Howard imitating a little bit. And I was like, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh. So I remember I grabbed you backstage and I said, you're coming. <laughs> you don't pay. It's free. You're coming tomorrow. <laughs> because I realized that, uh, uh, you know, I've been with you even when we're not together. I watch everything. I was there at South by Southwest when Times of Grace played in like 2007. Like I've been watching you even though you've been not watching me, mm. I follow everything. So I was so in love with Times of Grace and so heartbroken that you would be injuring yourself. So I made you come back. And um, and I think that that was like one of the best things I ever did because I got to know you even better. Yeah. <laughs> well, and you saved my ass after the, the surgery because I was – and I had no idea I was singing on a damaged voice. I had a, a nodule there for a long time. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah it's, it's crazy how that happened. And, I, you know, I remember you approaching me and telling me you've been watching. And then, you know, every once in a while, I'll get little notes from you. Like, I heard you do this. That There's a fry thing going on there. That's that's good. Do more of that. I'm like, ah. <laughs> I know. And fry is so low energy that yeah. it's so counterintuitive to the whole thing because – you know, one of the best things about Kill Switch is the authenticity. There's no ear candy. There's no fake stuff. It's just like in your fucking face, right? And so without ruining that authenticity, I wanted to just like put that little bit of spice of fry at the, just to give you a break so that you could like revert to it. But, you know, I, I think you're doing a great job, a great job. Thank you. Great yeah. job. Unbelievable. Like the authenticity is there. The sustainability is there. I know you, you know, get your fingers burnt when sometimes, but we all do, you know, you're an athlete. So that's to be expected. Yeah. It's a process for sure. I mean, just like anything in life, it's a process. So yeah. for me with, with you and you had mentioned this and I really want to go into to the past a little bit here because you'd mentioned being sober. When, when did that journey start and what, what brought you out of not being sober? So you got involved with, was this during the New York scene? Like when did your substance abuse problem start for you? My substance abuse started when I was 13. Oh, wow. I, I uh, actually, I was given a hit of acid for my 13th birthday and oh. dropped home alone. <laughs> so uh, like, uh, you know, I, uh, it was a matter of two years before I started uh, doing just anything. Like my dad was a doctor. So the cabinets were full of all these drug samples. And uh, I started to, okay, so there's this very kind of running with scissors story about being the daughter of a psychiatrist. Um, I was sort of pathologized from early on. First of all, I was a Beatle maniac, an absolute, I mean, I've been a rock chick since I was seven years old, the Beatles, right? So I wanted, I was, a, I, I, my first uh, exposure to obsession was the Beatles. Like I was gonna marry John, it was like, this is like, I had the lunch boxes, it was my whole life. So that um, rock thing, I always felt like I had a home there. Like I always had that, even though I was studying all this classical stuff and all that. I think I'm getting away from the question. What was the question again? <laughs> I always I do that. that. <laughs> good. No, it's good. No, I was just oh, yeah. the drugs. How did I... the drugs come in? <laughs> drug, this... drug, drug, drug. Okay. So many are great. <laughs> by, by the time I was 15, I was a full blown addict. Um, and that means anything to get out, anything to be out of my skin. It was that I was very troubled um and uh pathologized i don't know why my dad did what he did i think he was trying to help but i was you know I, I medicated when i was eight and medicated again when i was 13. so the whole idea of psychotropic medication was punishment to me so i stopped taking it and i you know hit lots of street drugs um and i continued to do that and, and when i got to the the old vic um someone said um i wanted to try heroin i wanted to try it because everyone was talking about it and people would say 
oh no, you're such a pretty girl. No, 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 don't go there. No, no, no. I was like, oh, come on. How, how, <sighs> please. And I, I started using heroin in the, the UK. And the first time I did it, th that was it. That was it. I was like, this is, this is the best. This is, there's no more pain. There's no more, it, and my acting, I thought my acting was so much better when I was, you know, high. And uh, what happened was there was this thing called Operation Julie in the UK, and there was no heroin to be had. So the only thing you could have was Coke. So I was already in this kind of rock circle because of some of the friends that I had, like, you know, you know, Bob Marley, Eric Clapton, like I became part of that scene with through Island Records. I used to hang out at St. Peter's Square and, you know, and do drugs with all these rock stars. And I thought that it was super glamorous, but I was literally falling apart. I, um, I, I even went to Peru to like, you know, be a runner. Like I could so wow. like, wow. oh yeah. I almost got put in jail, almost killed, you know, um, and all it was all in aid of getting enough drugs for me. It wasn't I wasn't trying to be a business person. <laughs> in fact, I, I left the UK as if I was going out for milk because I thought that these people were going to kill me because I didn't, you know, have the money that I was supposed to have to pay for what I had, you know, borrowed or whatever the fuck it was. <laughs> anyway, uh, by the time I got back to the uh, United States, my dad was ready to have me committed to a state hospital. And so I ran away to California. And uh, I ran away to California and eventually I started a band in California. Um, and we played, you know, the whiskey and, you know, um, the Starwood and Madame Wong's and all those places. And I, uh, I was working for a guy named Denny Cordell and Denny Cordell is a, uh, he's the guy, well, I know Matt, you know, all about this. There's this sort of British entourage of blue bloods that get involved in rock and roll, you know, and, uh, they're not liggers, but they're like people of, of wealth that are on the cutting edge of things. And so, I uh, met, got through Denny that way. So anyway, I was the secretary of Denny Cordell, who had Shelter Records, which is Tom Petty. And before that, he produced Procol Harum, Whiter Shade of Pale. And like, he was friends with Chris Blackwell at Island. So I was in that circle of music. And I, uh, I started booking bands at this place called Flippers, another Blue Blood project over the roller rink where I would like book bands like the Go-Go's the Blasters, the Plugs, the Circle Jerks, the Textones, like, and I would book my band in there with them. So I had like this regular residency in the middle of this roller rink <laughs> and it, it's, there's a CVS there now, but I think it was on like um, La Cienega and uh, Santa Monica Boulevard. It's a big CVS now, wow. but anyway, um, you know, we had, you know, lots of luminaries and basically I got fired from there because I went into the bathroom and shot up a bunch of coke and walked out of the bathroom and had a convulsion in front of like the so I got fired and I moved to New York <laughs> and it, it just went on and on from there I you know continued to use the guy in my band became my husband uh, oh my there are so many horrific stories of addiction um, where um, I was supposed to, my mother had this beautiful wedding, like all set up for me. And I OD'd on the bathroom floor and my father found me and uh, it disowned me. And oh God, it was like, it's such a mess. The bottoms of addiction, I've had more than one. You know, I mean, there was the what what made me surrender was that I had no other options. It was it I I went to I saw on MTV I saw this rehab. It was like one of the first rehabs, and it was 
John Phillips from the Mamas and the Papas and Michelle Phillips, and they were on this nighttime talk show, Dick Cavett, and they were talking about this place it, called Fair Oaks, which was a hospital for people that were having problems, and they were talking, they were telling things that were exactly my problem. So I ran away to Fair Oaks, <laughs> that was the first time, and they wanted to keep me there uh, under a 72 hour hold. And so I didn't want to be there anymore. And all of the patients there came down and said, you're an addict, you're an addict. I said, no, I'm not. Stop. I can still, I can, you know, my life's going to get together, everything. It's going to be fine. Well, while I escaped from there and during that time we got successful, our, our, our band got successful in terms of we were with, um, well, Kate Hyman uh, was you know, doing this thing with Michael Zilka and we were assigned to Z Records and and then uh, Chrysalis wanted us and then Warner Brothers wanted us and I had this lawyer that was the lawyer for you too and the lawyer for Pat and I was like, whoa, and I was very, very sick. So there was this big showcase and it was um, Chrysalis, Warner Brothers and Columbia at the time and they're all in this club waiting for this show and I bombed so bad. I had decided to detox two days before. So I was like a mess, a mess. And the whole, it, it, it was so bad that it was in the New York Times in the business section it was like, had she paused for breath or had she mercifully finished? Yep, she's finished. All right, said Jeff Aldridge, who, by the way, is the guy that signed Disturbed. Anyway, um, <laughs> I, I was, uh, <laughs> in fact, all these A&R guys, a lot of them are still like in the business. And I, I remember very well being as an artist on the side. And sometimes when they call, for their clients for a voice lesson. It's like, I remember you, you told me I was too much like the girl next to, you know, like, <laughs> it's just funny now to see, you know, Michael Lago and like all these characters in the business. And I was an, an artist. Anyway, I failed. I failed. I, I failed. And I, that was my dream. I had it right in the palm of my hand. And they tried to tell me, don't do the show. You need to get well hold up and like rah, 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 like just complete diva like i'm doing it now i'm sick of them sitting on the pot not there you know and sure enough it was a, a a disaster that i really never forgave myself for until a long time um and so uh that was surrender because i couldn't no one would talk to me no one would listen to me babble drunk or stoned anymore even my mother and that's what really did it when my mother stopped talking to me it was like okay sink or swim i had no money for drugs so i was already in a detox kind of state and i just had a guitar and i had no place to live no money no husband i'd already cleaned out the bank accounts right and i went to my first um I went to an NA meeting first, right? And so that was my first meeting. And all these people were, you know, I sat with the winos for a second and then I moved up to the front and I started listening and I stayed sober for a couple of years. And then I got a cough before a show and I had laryngitis and the doctor said, well, I gotta get you stop coughing. So you need to take this. And it was like, Hykodan, you know, codeine cough syrup. and you know, within two days, I'm like, okay, a teaspoon. Well, let me use the soup spoon. Okay, no, now I need the third cup. Okay, oh, the bottle's gone. Got to call the doctor, tell him I lost it. You know, I was off, right? So there, there, there were four of those relapses in the last 35 years. The last relapse. The last relapse was May, so it was 1998. So now I have 23 years sober. Wow. So, but there were four, you know, four bottoms at, even after that. And each one gets worse. Each one gets worse. You think it couldn't get any worse? It does. So I think that, you know, what 
I'm one of those real addicts who has to be beaten into submission, you know, and luckily I have this little spark in me that cannot die. You know, it's just always there. There's this little tiny little enthusiasm for possibilities. Uh, but I, I uh, also am managed on medication now. Right. And I think that if I had been properly medicated for my um, depression, I don't think that I would have had such a. Uh, well, the other thing that happened is that when I was 13, I was raped. Right. And that was my first experience with sex. I didn't even know what sex was. Wow. So there was this kind of. And I, I didn't tell anybody because I would have gotten in trouble if I had told anyone that I escaped a party to go and see this flower child that had a baby. You know, this was, remember, this is 1969. This is the beginning of the summer of, you know, this, this was a dawning of a new consciousness mm -hmm. in this country. And it, it's, that's why I love the metal thing, because it feels like 1968, very much like 1968 which is why I was so like, oh, I'm home, I'm home. This is the deal. This is why I got into this. It's, you know, that group camaraderie or that solidarity in terms of we do the right thing. We take care of each other. We don't abuse children and animals and we don't live our lives for money. You know, all that kind of stuff is close to me. And anyway, that's why I, I, I consider myself a metal kid, even though I'm 65. <laughs> no, it's, it's the disenfranchised, it's the freaks, it's the geeks, it's finding the people who can understand your pain really mm -hmm. is what attracted me to it. That's, yeah. a, that's a hell of a story. First of all, I'm sure you've heard this before, but you should write a book. My Lord, that's, that's, <laughs> and that's just a, a portion of it from what you're telling <laughs> me. My, my question to you is, after being raped, how did that change your mindset towards relationships? Did that deeply affect you for, I can only imagine, years? Like, how, do you, how did you, and that being your first experience, that's heavy. That's heavy. Yeah. Uh, well, so here's the thing. Number one, it, it taught me how to disassociate, mm. how to numb out. And it didn't teach me, it just happened. Because as it was happening, and I don't want to upset anybody. So if anybody's like, you know, turn off the turn off the volume for a second, because when it happened, I went limp. Like I didn't know what was happening. Why are these guys doing what are they doing? What what? What's that? Ah, and then I kind of woke up in my bathroom with blood everywhere, going, What the what is what's happening? What I was really, and then I thought, okay, now I'm now I'm grown up. Now I know what this is. Now I know what these people are giggling about and everything. So now nobody can fuck with me, you know. So I got this kind of like very um, uh, oversexed kind of like I'm the shit kind of thing, like as a kind of uh, reflex to like, but really. The way it affected me, and it still affects me, although I've been working on it for many years, is that I numb out. Mm -hmm. And when I numb out, I go into these kind of knee jerk behaviors of being um, submissive or being uh, self deprecating or being overly nice because I'm afraid you're going to leave me. Like, I just won't go into these kind of like, because at the bottom of my soul was the fact that I am a piece of shit, right? Because that happened to me. Like I am damaged goods. Like I'm, you know, so I got this hero in Janice Joplin because Janice was like the epitome of that. I, I felt her so much. So I started, you know, drinking Southern comfort and I've got this, you know, I got the same glasses and I got the frizzy hair and the beads and the, you know, I, I was going down with Janice <laughs> and, you know, Jimmy went down and Jim Morrison went down they, all at the same time, everybody started to like implode. And I felt like that was glorifying. Wow. It was a glorification. 
So I, I don't have that badass kind of thing anymore. Thank God. Um, I, it's much easier to be useful than it is to be badass. <laughs> but well, it was more fulfilling too. I'm assuming as well. Um, well, I, I I think that part of that was like, you know, when you get into a twelve step program, it starts talking about like the bondage of self and you know right sizing your thinking and you know I found that my thinking was very much in keeping with everybody else that was around me that very self serving and you know this, it's my show you know it's kind of an alcoholic addict kind of behavior and. I learned a lot of tools from AA, but the problem that I was having was the higher power thing. And not that I didn't believe, not that I was an atheist, but when I got multiple sclerosis after, you know, being, you know, in service and chairing meetings and setting up coffee pots, I was like, what the fuck club is this? You know, I don't want to be a member of this club that says, you know, turn it over to your higher power. Fuck that because I did that and look what happened to me. And see, that was another step in how uh, adversity actually makes me more useful. Mm -hmm. So, but I didn't know that. I thought that, you know, I just got dealt another raw deal. So that was at the bottom of a relapse too. So there was like all these kind of, um, I had to rethink this whole higher power thing because it wasn't working for me. People would come into a meeting and say, I want to thank my higher power for bringing me here today and keeping me sober. I was like, bullshit, hmm. that doesn't work, right? But I didn't know how to make it work. Now I I figured it out. I, I mean, no, I haven't figured it out, but I remember that I am much more useful having had all of these experiences because when somebody else is going through what I went through and they have nobody, I can be there if they want me to be. And that's amazing. That's amazing. That That is like much better than being a rock star because it's real. That's, that's like, that's stuff that you, that's the kind of love that you come in with and you take out with you. It's one of those things that are being empathetic mm -hmm. is, is part of love and that is real and all the other stuff the record deals you know how many streams you have all that stuff you can't take that with you it means nothing nothing and so i i allowed myself to feel those rushes of love and empathy and how important those things are in terms of a perspective a, sustainable perspective in life so you know i think and of course having a child so that that's being a parent is also a big turnaround so um my child is 21 and i stopped performing um when i had a child because i just couldn't justify being on stage at a gig when my baby is at home that just seemed like really I always wanted to have a baby. I always wanted to be a mom. So I've, I got my dream, so I decided I better. And I was already teaching. Oh, no. um, and I love teaching, love teaching. Someday I'll tell you the story of how I started teaching. <laughs> you wanna hear it? <laughs> <laughs> of course. Okay, I so. Just, real quick though, I just wanna to touch on the, the thing you said about empathy and love really strikes a chord with me because it's something that I carry with me and I consider it a total blessing, but at times it feels like a curse and it's really heavy, heavy to deal with when you're super empathetic. So I just wanted to give you kudos and, and shout outs for, for saying that. I think it's a very profound thing that you just said. It's a connection. That's what we, we are connecting that's what the music does mm. that's what we're doing now that's that's all there is for us is connection yeah. and so that i think that i know like being an empath has some casualties because sometimes from my point of view being more self-deprecating and more prone to believe that i'm not up for the job 
I feel that that empath thing makes me a little bit overly empathetic to the point where I allow myself to get destroyed. Um, and I make sacrifices against my own better judgment. But I would say that to err on that side is better than to err on the side of selfishness. So, Love it. you know, that I'll just do my best to take care of myself so I can continue to be a healthy empath. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, it's a fine line to walk. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because the rescue, the, the, the feeling of self-worth that you get when you help someone is a great thing. But if you have no self-worth be- except that, then there's a there's a wounded healer kind of aspect to that where it's not really it's I'm evading because I'm still running from that monster on the in my depths that center of me that says that I am the piece of shit. Wow. Yeah, I mean I believe that I believe it, and I don't I know it's not true, but it's just sort of in the fabric, you know when you walk by a store window and you see your reflection you go ugh, you know it's 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 something and now when i do that i go here you go again at least now i can notice it you know i can see like this is a part of me that i will continue to work on for a long time and i use the usefulness and empathy thing to counteract that but instead of facing it itself instead of facing the fact that i believe that which is flawed I will try to do all these actions to prove that I'm not a piece of shit <laughs> instead of just dealing with the fallacy to begin with. Right. But that's, I guess that's, that's heavy. That's, that's heavy. I'm sure a lot of people are nodding their heads while they're watching or listening right now. Cause yes. that's, that's heavy stuff right there. Avoiding the core of, of the issue and just putting band-aids on it. Yeah. That's heavy. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, um, you know, in, in AA, you're supposed to do this thing called the fourth step, and you're supposed to take an inventory, a fearless and moral inventory. And so instead of writing a fourth step, it's like I stole my ring, my sister's ring, uh, or whatever, you know, I, I did this, I did an inventory of what's going on in my psyche. And what I did was I put myself in the position of the last time a bag of dope hit my hand. And I went there and I kind of went down into the trance and I got this feeling. I, I saw a beached whale with it, all this grease and all these flies around and like beached, like dying in the hot sun. And, and beached whale is what I call this beached whale. And then I realized all the times in my childhood when I had felt beached whale and it went way back, like when I wet the bed, like when I, you know, my dad said, shut that racket when I was practicing my piano, like so many instances where beached whale became the, that was the core of it all. And I faced the beached whale and that was freedom. That was freedom because it didn't hurt. I was like, okay perfect piece of toast. I'm burnt. I've faced it. Can't hurt me anymore. That was a big um, kind of epiphany for me is that so what if I'm a piece of shit? I'm not but who cares? Just do your best. You know, like, I just faced it. Um, But it's still a process. Because instead of trying to get rid of those feelings, right now, I'm dealing with those personalities inside of me that I actually bring them to the table. Like I'm at the head of the table and there's like this 13 year old girl that feels abandoned and scared and like a piece of shit because of the rape and you know, the, all all the break. I mean, it's the same personality. And I talk to her, I bring her to the table. I said, what do you need today? What do you, you know, and that, uh, that character that I assume as a caretaker of all the demons helps me to understand the person that I really am, because I'm not playing a part. I'm actually experiencing being someone who has compassion for all these people inside of me. So instead of trying to get 
mentally sane or getting rid of all the demons, I welcome them as part of the fabric. And I feel like I work on conversations with those, with that, that little girl, I have a conversation with her quite often. Um, and I try to unblend my psyche from hers and be an empath, like a, like a therapist, but I'm not a therapist. It's just this kind of not no name being that comes over me where I say, Oh, I, I can handle this. I'm at the head of the table. I, we can work this out, you know, instead of trying to say, go away, go away, give me a pill, give me, of course, I still, I don't think that if I wasn't medicated that I would be able to have these conversations though, because I am really, I've got it bad. Um, you know, I was tried to kill myself like nine times before I was 20. So I was a sick little child. Um, and, uh, I think it's all working out now. <laughs> One day at a time. Well, actually, maybe not. <laughs> now, the way you're speaking about it is very mind blowing to me. It, I can see it. I can visualize the table. I like that idea. I've never heard it explained that way. I like that because you know I've got issues in my past I don't talk about, and I can totally relate on some level to what you're talking about. And that 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 little kid. You know, when you first get your scars as a young kid, like you said, even wetting your bed, like those memories stay with you mm -hmm. and they're a part of who you are, no matter how old you are, no, how, how successful or tough or whatever people see you as the core of who you truly are. There are a lot of locked boxes and secrets and things that people just don't know about. And I feel like as you let them out and air them and talk about painful things like you are as much as that's therapeutic for you, it's so much more, I think, therapeutic and helpful to other people to hear those types of things. Because people who go through trauma, and I've met, you know, my childhood wasn't so bad, but I've met people who have had horrific childhoods. And some of those people turn out to be some of the most amazing healers, the most amazing people who enable other people who have been hurt and damaged to sort mm -hmm. of air themselves out and build and become who they are. And what you're giving us so far is just such a powerful testimony. I actually almost started crying for a second there because of the images and what you're saying. And that's incredible to hear your journey and what you've been through, what you've shared so far, and to be where you are now, where you're able to sort of manage yourself. And I like that inviting those demons or those dark things to the table instead of pushing them aside. Because I think how often a lot of people just do that. That's why a lot of people are alcoholics and drug addicts or sex addicts or whatever the case, numbing that pain and not growing and not taking the time to face it. That's powerful stuff. Well, I, I, I have to give credit or credits to you because this was a, a therapeutic journey. It started when I was doing um, gestalt therapy and gestalt therapy is what the therapist would do was have me identify a physical feeling of beached whale. So beached whale is a concept, but beached whale as a physical sensation is a stabbing in my right in the center. In other words, I used to call it the black cloud when I was 12, where if I felt the black cloud for five days, I would usually act out on it, like, you know, cut my wrists or take an OD or, you know, like I could just feel it was a black cloud. And it just, it was the cloud of, it's always been this way. It's always going to be this way. There is no hope and I'm a piece of shit. So what the fuck, go, leave. It's like, jump, go, right? I That black cloud physically feels like somebody is punching me in my solar plexus and it goes in like this. And it's like, it almost burns. So whenever I don't, like take my medicine on time and that feeling comes back. I go, oh, there it is, there it is. And that disassociates me from it because it's like, it's, it's the physical, it's not me, it's my solar plexus, it's not me. So that was the beginning of being able to disassociate from those intense, despondent, kind of catatonic states of sadness. And 
that evolved into internal family systems and internal family systems is like a kind of a new model like there's a guy uh i'm sorry i don't remember his name but he started it he started this kind of, so they have all these names for like protectors and managers and you know they have this kind of uh, uh, vocab of it's a kind of internal psychodrama and what's you know what's really quite amazing is that my dad was one of the pioneers of psychodrama wow. like he was like the psychiatrist and there was a psychologist and the two of them together spread psychodrama but this is a new kind of psychodrama uh, that's internal so you don't act it out with other group therapy patients you act it out inside of yourself with these different they're called parts so i sit with my parts now the table part that's my idea but the concept of accepting the demons as part as an integral part of the journey and that they should be along instead of trying to pathologize them or get rid of them that was not original that's internal family systems so you know i've been working on this stuff <laughs> i had to i had to and now i have a child it's the same stuff i'm watching it you know as a mom so he's, I loved, he's going yeah. through the same thing that you went yep. through he's got the wow yep uh, except that he has a I'm pretty candid about this stuff. So he's very afraid of alcohol and drugs because he knows that, you know, what the possibilities are. And he's, you know, he lost his best friend last year from a suicide. And I was losing my mom in Texas at the same time. So I had had to leave him alone in New York to go and protect my mom which I, you know, failed, but he went through that without me there. And I've, you know, he's still going through that. We, we work on it together. Like I have, I lost my mom. He lost his best friend, Zeno, you know, but this last year has been quite, quite profound in terms of adversity and death. Mm -hmm. um, so there's always something to work on getting there <laughs> yeah i've never felt so lost for words in all my life i'm not usually this quiet in in podcast melissa and just listening to you talk has moved me to tears and um you've used the word failure a couple of times in relation to yourself but i would say you're the exact shining opposite of that um i've never met anybody and i would love to meet you someday um i've never heard somebody just have so much heart and soul and wisdom and, and, you know, see such little of how other people see them themselves. Um, and obviously that's what makes you special is, you know, you aren't arrogant, but you're an amazing person. I don't really know what to say. I just wanted to jump in and show some solidarity here. And as I said, I'm not usually someone who's lost for words, but I know there, there amazing... were moments where I'm waiting for you to jump in. I'm like, Matt, <laughs> and Matt's just sitting <laughs> <laughs> taking it in because you know, it's he's right though it's heavy and it's profound and i've never heard it spelled out the way that you're spelling it out so there's a lot of wisdom there and you know it's funny because i've always seen you as a teacher of voice but i mean this is a whole other a whole other angle and a whole other level of who you are and this i can tell you right now this podcast is going to help people i just it's already helped me it's moved me and my brain is like Cause I've been going through a funk on and off for the past few months and, and like that negative speak, you, you, we've talked about this before, Melissa, it mm -hmm. just that imposter syndrome, all those things. I know that really well. It's something I struggle with on a regular basis and mm -hmm. having my sort of purpose taken away from not being on the road. It, I really had to face a lot of things uh, and it's been painful and it's been hard. And lately it's been extra hard and I li literally feel like I'm coming out of a, a dark space in my head. Um, but some of the things you've said really, I, I'm already like, wow, I got to add that to the, to the archives and to the tools. You know, we all get tools when we, we gain wisdom and knowledge from people. So already what you've said is profound and what a, what a journey you've been on so far. And I know this is just like a portion of it and that's just profound to me. It's mind blowing. And I'm to see really watch this now too, so many right? Times. What? 
I'm going to rewatch this episode so many times because there's so many amazing pieces of information and advice that I'm trying to listen and take in. But I mean, the reason me and Jesse started this podcast was exactly this. Like sometimes when you're in the moment and you feel like the conversation that you're having is changing your life in real time. Um, and that's why we started this show is to have these kind of chats and yeah, I actually got a lot of healing from, uh, the podcast that you did, uh, it was just the two of you, you were talking about grief. Uh, it was after Leroy. I love your dad, Jesse. Yeah. I, love him. <laughs> I love that guy. Yeah. Uh, I, I got a lot of healing from that. So I, I like this podcast a lot because we get to talk about the stuff that really matters. Yeah. <laughs> this is the stuff that really matters. And I just think that we should all just book a trip to the desert and take mushrooms. Yeah. <laughs> oh Let's just, let just start over. <laughs> That's awesome. Love it. I love it. Are you, are you allowed to do that, Melissa? Um, how, no. How, no. Well, I, uh, this is how I see it. I'm allowed to do whatever I want because it's mm. my choice. Of course. But I don't make that choice because the the experience that I've had in recovery after four relapses is that I don't want anything close to going back. So there's this interesting thing because I have these rules and regulations that I don't feel are really relevant, but I don't take a glass of wine with dinner, even though I think it would taste really good. It's just not worth the risk. Yeah. Um, I have, you know, when I think about like microdosing or, or mushrooms, right? I think about that as, you know, Carlos Castaneda kind of, you know, journey in spirituality and stuff. But then I think, ah, that's your denial. You see, you're trying to get back. So I, I, there's a demon that's like, don't do that. And then I thought, no, you're not my boss. I have to, <laughs> I, I'm having dialogues with the authoritarianism of that. Con, you know, construct of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, I don't really fit, but at the same time, I'm going to be super prudent and not if I do make that choice to 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 trip or something, it's going to be after a great deal of um, speculation about whether it means that I would use that as an excuse to go on a roll. So yeah. um, it and sounds... there's a whole nother thing about that, that, you know, with chronic pain, like I, I have to tell you, and, and there might be other people that were helped by this, but I'm not allowed to take aspirin. I can't take any kind of painkiller because I'm on blood thinners. So when I have like major pain issues with the MS and also like having a knee replacement in the back, there's no discs in my back, all that crap, I had to take narcotics and that was hard because i didn't want to let them go i tried you know my body would actually make myself sicker so i could keep taking the drugs that's how strong addiction is mm. and so you know i had to detox from opiates when i hadn't even relapsed which was wow uh, what a you know what a whammy was that but you know what i did it and uh, it didn't beat me, but I had a lot of help. I, the, the, here's the thing about being an addict. It's the sneakiness. It's the isolation. It's all about being isolated. It's about cutting off the connection and going in, being in this womb of nothing matters and everything is fine. That heroin thing, right? It's so, it feels like the answer. It's diabolical. Right, because that is where the trouble starts, is the secrets. Right. So I immediately, you know, as soon as I had to deal with this, I reached out and it was not maybe two or three years. Oh yes. It was during the detox that I got suicidal again. And this time, instead of staying by myself, and this was around the time uh where we lost uh uh Chester and Chris. Right. So it, it was around that same time. And I, I was like, OK, I'm not going down. I'm not I'm not going to I'm not going to do that. And I raised my hand and I embarrassed myself and I called everybody I knew to tell them I want to die. Please help me. I just like raise your hand. 
it's like, forget your ego, raise your hand. Don't keep it a secret. And that works. That really worked because I allowed people in. But that isolation is that sneakiness. That's when I know that I'm in trouble is when I'm, you know, not telling the truth. So now, I mean, I always tell the truth now. If I lie, I'm in big trouble. <laughs> yeah, that's, I think that's an important thing to say right there is, you know, the whole hashtag that's been going around for years now, it's okay not to be okay. Like normalizing talking about this type of thing, normalizing saying when you're not okay and how difficult that can be, but how rewarding and how life altering it can be because you are potentially saving yourself. And I've had to do that myself in my own life where, yeah, I, the secrets, that's another thing. Like if you're just trying to deal and I do this a lot, I just, if I come into a situation, I, I push people away. Like I got this, I'm going to figure this out. And that's usually when I start to spiral. And the moment I ask for help or say, I'm not okay, that's when things start to shift. And exactly. that's heavy. Exactly. And I, I, I was just thinking, you know, Matt, you were talking about how your mom lost your little sister and it devastated her idea about the hopefulness of there being a point to being alive. And I was really touched by that because I think that a lot of the self judging and the uh, it's my fault that can somehow I was able to like get this feeling that your mom wasn't like she was she was very helpful to people I mean she was a lot more than she thought that she was but because of this overriding grief of of losing that that baby I, I mean I, I also lost a baby I lost a baby she only lived for 18 minutes but that is really devastating that's a devastating experience and by the way i found out that my mother also lost a baby before i was born and she never told me but she helped me with the funeral of my baby without even telling me that she'd been through it before so there's this kind of like thing about older people that they think that they're supposed to do this by themselves that's kind of the culture you know that's leroy culture that's you know my mother's culture you don't complain, you don't explain, you just deal. Keep your mouth shut, you know, keep your, you know, pull up your bootstraps and go, right? And so I have um, a lot of love for your mom, Matt. <laughs> I, I, I love your mom. I, I, I really appreciate you telling that story um, because it's, it's, uh, it's pretty heavy losing a baby. You think it's your fault, you know, Ugh. it was that, it was that drink I had, it was that cigarette I smoked, it was, you know, a million things, right? And it just wasn't meant to be. And uh, I'm glad that she had, you know, you as a son. Matt. <laughs> I'm glad I, she had you as a son. I will pass on your love with <laughs> all my love too. And um, yeah, there's there's something really special. I don't know whether it was yourself or Jesse, you said it, but about people who've been through great pain, great loss, great trauma. And it often creates these really loving, caring, kind, empathetic people. And I would say like everything that is good in my heart and, and my personality comes from my mum. All of, all of that softness and love and the good stuff. There's a couple of things from my dad too, but I don't want to leave him out. But yeah, um, you know, what she went through kind of, you know, it ruined her life in so many ways and she never really made it back from that. But, you know, I wish she just kind of could see and I'm going to tell her the next time I see her to try and reinforce it. But every kind of moment of love and care and affection that she's given me and my sister has made us the people that we are today. And without her, we would have been, you know, completely lost. Yeah, and sometimes it's just that inability, isn't it, to see past the the tragedy. And some people struggle so hard with that. And I know she still does, but I do know that when we're together as a family, you know, she's always present in those moments and and loves it, loves it. And that's, she gave you the capacity. And uh, 
I just had to go back to the scene of my, you know, mother's passing, which was horrific. Uh, and I, what I did was I became her because I became all those things that I was, I mean, I just became her. I, I remember when she was leaving and she was passing that I felt her jump inside of me. So when I visited like last week and I saw the place that it all happened, she wasn't there. She was in me. Hmm. She was in me. And I was saying the things that I thought that she would say and getting my fear and my selfishness out of the way and trying to help my sister, who's like very contentious. And it's just a big mess. I'll tell you about another time. But, you know, there were imposter caregivers that took over my mother's uh, affairs, fortune, you know, it was, and I tried to protect her and my sister wouldn't let me. Oh. So there's this, this, like, and she died, you know, she died with rotten teeth, this gorgeous lady. Like, it was awful what they did. And, you know, my sister defended those caregivers. So I had to put away my animosity and because I know that all my mother wants is for us to be a family. Mm. That is what she wants. I'm a mom. I know that the only thing I care about really is my kid. And I know that I did everything I could to save her. And I know that I failed, but I did everything I could, everything I could. I called the court. I called the adult protective services. I, you know, I did everything I could, and now that every, she's gone, I hear her, and all she wants is for me and my sister to be friends like we were. So I got to figure out a way to, to do that without compromising myself, you know, but I was her. So you have your mom in you. She's not a failure. She didn't let, you know, it's, she's a winner. Yeah. We all are. Amen to that. Yeah. Is your sister on board for reconciliation? My sister is a mess right now. Mm. And uh, my sister is broken out in a rash all over her body. And I see when I first saw that, that all her haughtiness and contentiousness was on the pathetic side because she was so ill. And I had, it, it helped me jump to a, a compassionate place because I saw that it, my mother would be heartbroken to see my sister like this. So even though she was mean to me and she prevented me from taking care of my mother and all that stuff, I need to heal her. And there's people saying, no, you don't have to do that. Why do you always try to take care of everybody else? You see, because I get accused of like, you know, taking the high road a little too often. But the thing is, is that if that's the end result and I'm okay with it, then it's okay. Yeah, I'm all about uh, that too. I'm all about that. I think that the the process of healing, you know, it whitewashes a lot of the bad stuff, doesn't it? That has occurred and transpired. And, you know, I just want to get to that place with certain people in my life too. And I'm willing to, and this doesn't, it's not about trying to be a better person. It's just trying to like, yourself be at peace and see the people you love at peace isn't it just all of yeah. us trying to find peace together at any cost mm. even if it's millions of dollars you know even if you're I, I lose you know my fortune or whatever I, it doesn't matter it's because the, all that stuff is just going to go away but the winter stuff the compassion the love nothing can destroy that nothing can destroy that Amen. Yeah, it's the it's it's all about that end result, that that blessing, that thing that you can't, like you said, put a price on. That's the stuff of life, right there. I love it because love, at the end of the day, you know, and this is something I truly believe is the most powerful thing we could ever attempt to understand or try to give to other people and give to ourselves. That is the. I think that's that's why we're here on this planet is to try to understand that word love that we throw around so much because it's so much more powerful, I feel, than anybody will truly ever be able to grasp. And that's yeah. it. 
it's there it's just we have i have to allow it it's not like i have to like reinvent it yeah. i have to allow it to take over without feeling like i'm weak or too soft i have to allow it it, it it's the only thing that it really is real it's the only thing that you can't kill i saw that when i when i was with my dad when he passed i I saw all the accomplishments and everything that he did. And I was like, you know what? All that matters is like, who loved you and who do you love? That's it. That's it. At the end, you're not taking it with you. So, you know, mm. that is, uh, but it feels, you know, the high road sometimes feels like the weak road. But yeah, I think it's the voice inside you, but it's also society you know i think there are so many people who look at people like us people who are empathetic people who bend over backwards go the extra mile extend themselves and i get it there's a certain amount of self-preservation we all need to have but I, i'm with you i'd rather put myself into a little bit of pain or a lot of pain to help somebody to get that end result of like harmony and love and i do think society still frowns on that because Let's be honest, if you look at the world, it's very self-serving. You look at social media, you look at all these things, it's just all about the self. Yeah. Putting yourself up, making yourself look a certain way, pleasing yourself, and like that's not the higher calling for all of us. It's not, and it truly is a strength and not a weakness. But I just think the fine, fine, fine line is self-preservation and self-care and just not neglecting yourself. And how do you balance that? And like you said at the top of this, you're still learning, it's a process. We have to continue to strive to learn to do without losing sight of, you know, the end result, which is living in love. Yeah, it. I feel much better when I help somebody than I do when I, you know, drink a glass of water. So, I, you know, but I should drink more water, but I don't get anything out of drinking water. But I get a lot out of like somebody saying, oh, cool, I'll try that or, you know, whatever. Like, mm -hmm. I feel better or just like, okay, I'll call you later. All right, I'll check on you. I even just like the end saying where I was like, I'm, I'm watching you, I got your back. That feeling I get when I know that somebody really needs to hear that. And I need for them to know that that is much better than the self care stuff. Mm -hmm. So I, I just have to strike a balance. That's where my mother comes in and says, Melissa, you're over the top again. <laughs> <laughs> No, you've just got to carry on being selfless and giving, but just hydrate at all times as well. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. On that note, cheers. Yeah, I'll drink too. Jeez. <laughs> this is just water, by the way, Melissa, not to leave. Yeah, water. This is just pure well, vodka. No, I was kidding. <laughs> I was actually going to put this, usually I have this in a wine glass, but I didn't want people to like, uh, this is like um, sort of like ginger beer. Fever oh, tree. Okay. Fever tree, yes. Love it the good stuff <laughs> fever tree is so good you have tried the orange one the orange spice yeah. ginger oh my god anyway it looks like man. white wine yeah ginger is life i drink ginger every single day i love it love it love it ginger tea i take raw ginger in the morning and shave it into a boiling pot every single morning i love it wow yeah that keeps you well yeah and it, it helps keep the the mucus uh at bay as well yeah which is, yeah which has been very helpful for me yeah so this this episode went. I mean, I knew it was going to be deep, but I moved to a whole other level, and it's incredible how we start out with, which it still can't be understated what you've done for vocalists and voice and music, but it started out on that and just went into a territory I knew it was going to go into. But man, the depths of what happened during this conversation will echo throughout this uh, throughout this podcast. Mm -hmm. And I would have to say we could go on for hours, but I really, truly want to say right now, no matter what happens, we need a part two with you. We need to okay. talk. Okay. I was going to say, because I forgot about the part about the Bible the the yeah. <laughs> There's a lot. And, you know, it's important. I think it's truly important that this type of thing is discussed. And, and as Matt said at the top, you know, this is why this right here is why we did this when this podcast came along into my life i was in a dark i didn't realize it at the time i was in a very dark place i had no purpose i didn't feel like i was useful 
and no matter how many people message me or tell me your lyrics to have got me through this and like all the stuff that is usually there for me that I should probably pay a little more attention to. I was at the point where not that was out the window and Matt approached me with this and coming full circle to this moment right here with you, somebody who's helped me so much in my life with my voice and a friend to someone who's dropping crazy wisdom on the struggles people can have inside of their own minds from their trauma and from their childhoods and from these the terrible things that they've been through and working through toxic relationships. To me, this is the essence. If you were to like sort of uh, extract the essence of this podcast, I feel like this episode really encompasses all of that. So all hails to you. This has been incredible. Yeah, you guys are in so much better shape than I was at your age. Trust me, you're going to be walking on the water by the time you're my age. <laughs> it's amazing. There's, there's certain guests that we have on who I feel like they become part of the fabric of the show. Um, and every conversation is special, but there are certain ones that just, I mean, they change me as, as they're happening um, and improve me and elevate me. And, and this has done that more so than any other. And um, I just, I can't wait to meet you in person. And we should do a part two, but we should do it in person. I feel like, you know, the energy and the the magic that would occur with the three of us in the room together as well would be like this times a thousand. But this is, I mean, this has already been one of the most moving and, and profound conversations of my life. So thank you so much, Melissa. Yeah, You're very welcome. And you're so welcome to come and stay here. You know, you have a place to stay in New York when you can get back over here. Um, yeah. And uh, there's plenty of room here and we could do a podcast. We could talk about stuff and it'd be good. <laughs> I'll cook. <laughs> yeah, if it all goes well, the, the the plan eventually is once we get to, to that point where we can, Matt and I would love to do a little road trip and just kind of do these, a string of these, you know, maybe like a little two-week road trip at some point. Oh, so, that would be awesome. Yeah, the New York destination, uh, you're definitely one of the people we got to get on there. Um, awesome. So that's, that's we hope that's something we're going to do in the future because even when we first started this podcast, the thought was, yeah, do it like this now. And then eventually get around an actual fire, get around people's kitchen tables, like make this like yeah. sort of Anthony Bourdain meets. Yeah, the, I was just going to say Bourdain. <laughs> that's he was one of the catalysts. It was Joe Strummer and Anthony Bourdain were kind of like the two guys that we sort of put up and said, this is our motivation here moving forward. Like, this is what we want to do. So the Anthony Bourdain part has yet to really see itself. But um I can already see it happening. I can see the two of us. Yeah. With a little camera and like, yeah, we'll make it happen. We'll figure it out. Let's do it. Let's do it. It's great. I want to be on it. Oh yeah. Honorary guest, Melissa, you're going to be. And if you are comfortable with it, this is a conversation you can have with yourself. But if you ever want to come out to the desert with me and Jesse and be our guru whilst we trip, (laughs) uh, (laughs) and and you can just take care of us and talk us through the journey. (laughs) I, I would be a thousand percent up for that. Okay. Then you're then you still there turn. in spirit and you're, you know, looking after yourself too. <laughs> okay. So I'm drinking water in the desert. Yes. Okay. <laughs> you, could be, you could be the guide, the guide to us as we're all like us. <laughs> I would love to trip sit for both of you. <laughs> This has been so great, and um, I have nothing more to add because I just feel like I'm going to be taking this in for another yeah. another few weeks. But just thank you so much for everything, and it's so clear why now all of these people who, you know, their job is to command the stage and spread the message and bring people together and, you know, shine as, as kind of lighthouses for the masses. It's so clear why you're like the lighthouse for all of these people. Um, you're a magical, magical woman. I think we all do things to talk about love it's just like i knew voice but i'm really talking about life and love and jesse you do music because you know you guys do what you do because you're transmitting the life and the love that you are so the content of what that is is kind of irrelevant because it's really the love that you are Mm. the efforts that you put forth for others and and for yeah you guys are really good good people Likewise, Melissa, and thank you for everything. And we will talk soon um, separately because I still have to pick your brain on the knowledge you have for the voice. Because yes, 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 yes. I will, You're say, gonna be- I will say this too before this ends. Uh, you helped me learn how to speak 
differently. And I think in closing, I want to let people know it's not just about singing and screaming. It's actually like the basis of what you've done for me is taught me how to speak differently. Mm -hmm. And that, that, it sounds simple to most people, but that changed a lot in my brain. The fundamentals of communicating really is a whole, we could do a whole other episode on just that. Absolutely. Power of communication. Yeah. So thank you for that. Because every single day I hear your voice when I do my warm ups and every morning I, I hear you you're in my head constantly you're you, i listen to you more than i do any other band on the planet so thank except you. it's always starting with this note <laughs> i know it by heart it's beautiful so much love to you teacher friend and um we'll speak soon and thank you for coming on and gracing us with your presence thank you for asking me it's a great honor and matt this is not the last time i will see you Thanks so much, Melissa. Take care.